All right. Good afternoon and welcome to Emory's Living with MCI Dementia webinar series. I am Alice Cooper Salisbury. I forgot to change my name. Um, and I am one of the clinical social workers in the Cognitive Neurology Clinic. I'm joined by my colleagues, Debbie Arnold, who is with CEP, the Cognitive Empowerment Program and Cognitive Neurology, and Jenny Gay, who is with the Integrated Memory Care Clinic. So uh, today we are going to have two guests that Debbie is going to be introducing, and then Jenny will be handling the questions and answers afterwards. So what we're gonna do is this is a webinar. So your cameras are not turned on, we cannot see you. Uh, you, will, you are muted or actually not able to speak on this webinar series, but we want you to participate. So please put your questions um, in the Q&A box, uh, not the chat box, in the Q&A. Please put your questions whenever you're thinking about them and Jenny will get to them um, when the panelists have finished speaking, when our present presenters, excuse me, have finished speaking. Um, this is a monthly webinar series. And so I just want to give you a heads up for next month. We are going to have our own Dr. James Law speaking, the neurologist, and he's going to be doing an overview of MCI and dementia and some updates on some of the medications, uh, the new treatments that have come out. And so please join us next month, but you will get a reminder email about that coming. So I am going to turn it over to Debbie to go ahead and introduce our speakers. Thank you, Alice. I am really excited uh, to introduce Jana Eplin and Melissa Benton. Uh, they are with Senior Living Solutions. Um, and they're gonna tell you a bit more about uh, the placement services that they provide. Um, and they are offering us an overview of the senior living landscape today. Um, Jana is a native Atlantan. Um, her first introduction to caregiving came when her own mother was diagnosed with early onset uh, dementia at the age of 68. Um, and she lived with that for 17 years, which fueled uh, Jana's education, both about memory loss and the range of living options. Um, and Jana's first foray, foray into working in the senior living industry uh, was as a mystery shopper. Um, and she visited over 100 communities, learning the ins and outs of what makes a community successful. Um, she has now been doing uh, senior placement for over seven years and has helped hundreds of families successfully navigate this journey. Um, she and her business partner, Kathy Mayville, launched Senior Living Solutions in 2022 uh, to broaden their impact in guiding families through this process. When she's not working, Jana lives in Morningside. She is an avid uh, binge watcher, reader, and jewelry crafter and she loves hanging out with her husband, Craig, and her three grown children who are charming. <laughs> um, and Melissa Benton, um, beginning in uh, 2006, Melissa was a primary caregiver for her grandparents, uh, one of whom had Alzheimer's disease. And after they passed, other people um, asked how she had navigated this process alone from home care and moving to a community, memory care, hospital stays, rehab and hospice. Um, and she is really passionate about helping people like her who were caring for aging loved ones without a roadmap. Um, she left her previous career and began working in senior living placement in 2014. Um, and she founded, co-founded and operated an Atlanta-based local placement company. Um, and after seven years, she returned to the field to work with families as an advisor with Senior Living Solutions. So I'm really happy to, um, to welcome my friends and colleagues, Jana and Melissa. They are really experts at what they do. And I am going to be sharing a PowerPoint and uh, we'll 
hopefully have the slides cooperate with me. Are you now seeing? Yes. Okay, great. Thank um, you, Debbie. We appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here today with you guys. Um, and as as you said, um, my, my journey started with my own mother, who was very young at the time to have dementia and memory loss. Um, but it did, it did show me how much I wanted to be a part of this, this solution. Um, so we are happy to be here with you. We hope that you have lots of questions. Please don't hesitate to ask anything uh, at all. So as Debbie mentioned, I've been in this industry for about 10 years. It's a passion of mine. We at Senior Living uh, Solutions, it's really important that we've been caregivers, connecting with our families. We know what they're going through. We know the emotion. We know the fear. We know the denial. We understand exactly what's happening through the whole process, which I think is very important for us to be able to tell them ahead. This is what you can expect. This is, you know, untrue what you've heard. Here are resources that help. So I think it's really important that we can personally relate to what our clients are going through. So Debbie, you can turn to the next slide. So we understand that the actual decision to move someone into senior living or to move yourself into senior living is a big decision. And we understand that there, it's it's a, especially if you've been in your home a long time, you are daunted by what might be in your home with you, all your things, selling your home. If you can afford senior living, um, will it make your life better? Will it take away all of your independence? So there's a lot to think about when you think about moving to senior living. Uh, in, in my case, my father was doing great and was still working. And we moved my mother into senior living without him. But uh, oftentimes we have couples who wanna move together, uh, both need some kind of care or not. We, we have done, we, it's run the gamut for us. Yeah, and I'll just, oh, sorry, I'll just add the biggest question, right, when we start first talking to a client is, where do I start? <laughs> do I just Google memory care or assisted living in Atlanta? No. <laughs> um, we just like to tell people to, to kind of stay off the internet in that way. A brochure version is not going to give you any idea of who the people are that are caring for, touching your person, who the leadership of the building is. So getting started and even just the first step is huge. So, Absolutely. Um, and Debbie, you can turn to the next slide. So not only is it hard to talk about doing a move, but it it's also hard to decide when to have this talk. When When is it important to move somebody? Is it important before someone doesn't have the memory to remember where they were or is it important to do it before that maybe when they can appreciate the social life and the engagement or um or just and and you should always know also that you can't expect just to have this talk one time um this is not an easy talk it also uh people are in denial and and it's not a one-time talk where you'll have to have this talk more than once and you'll have to be armed with some information about why and where and how. Um, the um, other thing that I think a lot of people, a lot of our, our clients have run up against is their family member has asked them, begged them, implored not to move me. Please don't move me somewhere. Don't, don't, don't put me somewhere. Um, and that's a hard, that's a very hard thing, but we always recommend not answering that because you can't promise that. You, your own health is important. Your own life is important. Your, the, the hanging out with your grandchildren is important and you can't do it with someone who's got significant memory loss. So 
our recommendation is to try not to answer that question um, if, if you can. Um, there's a lot of issues that we will talk about why and how, and we've illustrated some of them here. Um, but in the other thing that we have brought that we have seen is that sometimes people have more independence when they are in a community. Um, because if you have care in your home, you can't escape that because they're always there. If you have if you move into a community, you can shut your door and be alone and have some privacy and independence um, for sure. Melissa, do you want to add something, anything to that? So generally, as we say, you don't know what you don't know. When people think of going to a community or most likely we use the, you know, the facility word, right? And that doesn't sound like living at all, but it's not like you get up and want to visit a community on a Saturday and take a tour. <laughs> so once you're in this process, it's hard to explain if you haven't seen it. Most people have an idea that communities are a nursing home and it's not independent and it's not promoting dignity. So sometimes, you know, that's generational, some generational sometimes, but it is important that either if you've had, like Jana said, you're going to have the conversation more than one time. Once you approach it and you kind of see what the questions are, once you work an advisor, when you go to a community on your own, we definitely recommend a family visiting first and getting the information. So then as questions, specific questions come up or perhaps you decide to share the brochure, other information, you are armed with more knowledge to answer them better when you've actually seen what a community is. And the amenities and all of the activities and services and buildings that are offered now and even the past five years are quite amazing. And, you know, our clients want to live there even. So it's good to have that information to give a really positive light that it's a community uh, and not a facility. Next slide, Debbie. So, so you've decided to move. You've decided to have that conversation. You've decided you and your family, hopefully your other members of your family have helped you make that decision and also helped you vocalize why. Um, so our suggestion is to call an expert, potentially someone like us, but certainly a local expert. Uh, there are all kinds of commercials for national companies, but we have found local people certainly know what's going on in each individual building better. Um, they know the neighborhoods, they know the leadership. Uh, and we'll talk about leadership over and over again because it seems to be the most important factor in choosing senior living. Who is in leadership? Who is, whose culture is, cre is created and, and making a happy place uh, and, and so that's something that we know about and the, and we would, we certainly aim people toward what we think of as good leadership. Um, of course, you have to prioritize some things. Location, you obviously want it to be easy for family to visit. Um, the, the activities and the social life in a community, your finances and budget are gonna be a big part of a decision and what you can do. Uh, and, and also, does it feel like the right place? There's a lot of visceral feelings in choosing a community. Next slide, please. Oh, wait, let me just add a couple oh, of sorry. things. Quick. That's okay, that's okay. Um, just know that as the disease progresses or memory progresses, you may have to give up location as one of the prime factors because for us care always comes first and there may be communities that have specialties or um, have the ability to take care of a high care resident so sometimes wherever the best place is may not be extremely close or 10 minutes down the road so that's just something to consider um, in terms of care the other thing and when you're looking around and having a tour, it's important for you to say to yourself, are these peers of my parent? Do they seem like they could have conversations with them? They're on the same path as them. They're around the same 
age or active, you know, active like that, they're going to make friends. So that's another big important aspect. And like Jana said, this is going to be a gut decision. So when you're in a community, you'll know very quickly if it's the right fit or not. So we get a lot of questions like, how do I know? And we just say, trust us, you, you will know, you know, your parent and you'll have definitely a feeling of what's right. There is a lot of, um, it's easy that the communities seem to tend to look the same. So when Melissa said, we often suggest that family members go visit first and narrow it down because they can all look the same, even though they range widely. Uh, it is, it, it, it's overwhelming. So we always recommend that somebody visit a community uh, and potentially not alone, maybe with someone else they trust. Um, just as you might at a doctor's appointment, get some another ear so you hear things differently and then narrow it down sometimes to the one place that you've decided. Um, and we have found that sometimes that works best. You don't need to show a million places to somebody or even two places to somebody. Oh, yeah. So we're going to talk about the different kinds of living, uh, of senior living. All right, Debbie, Melissa, you want to talk about the CCRC? Um, yes, we're on one size fits all, right? Oh, sorry, sorry, that's the, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, okay, so of course, for most people, the dream is to stay at home and to age in place alone. I mean, at, at home with what they know around them, right? However, number one, home care is extremely expensive. And for the majority of people, it's cost prohibitive. So 20 is $25, $35 an hour. Usually companies have a minimum. And certainly if you're in 24 hour care, that's you're adding up to over $10,000 minimum a month. Um, so a lot of times the staying at home part, even though you want to becomes financially inaccessible. The other thing is, is safety. And if there are stairs, if you know, your loved one is getting up in the middle of the night. And so those are the two things to consider with staying at home. Home care is very advantageous for a short period of time or perhaps a bridge time. Um, you would just want to make sure a good plan is in place with your home care company. They're people too. They have family emergencies and there just needs to be a backup in case, you know, you have to have another caregiver come at a quick moment. The next is independent living. This is different from a 55 and over community. So 55 and over communities are typically condos or cluster homes or a neighborhood that you know, have the age requirement, but they're not necessarily a community in that they have organized activities. Um, it's more a living situation for people who wanna downsize, they're still very active, some even still work. But an independent living community is a building or a set of buildings on a property, and there are apartments, and then some of the properties have bungalows, cottages, and villas that are standalone um, structures. But independent living is going to offer meals, and now these are dependent on each community, whether you have one meal, two meal, meal plans, etc. But they'll provide meals, they provide communal dining, they have activities, they have transportation to take, go on outings. Um, and it's just a real feel. It's, everyone is there to meet friends and to socialize and to gather with others in their peers. So the independent living, though, does not offer care because in Georgia, those buildings don't have to be licensed. So anyone can build an independent living community. But once you bring care into the picture, that is assisted living and those are highly regulated. Um, so if you need care or assistance in independent living or even just man medication management, you would need to hire an outside care company to come and provide those services. Some communities have a care company contracted on site, so it's very easy for them to do small increments of time at a smaller cost when that's the case. Or you can, of course, always choose another home care company to come in. Um, to provide you know, other services if you're not interested in moving to assisted living and they're just not ready yet. So assisted living is the next step. 
doesn't always mean that you need care because care is paid for on the basis of what you need. So a lot of people move to assisted living because they don't want to make a second move. That's, those are different apartments. Um, assisted living is they're not going to have full kitchens. They have a small kitchenette. Um, typically, the apartments are smaller, although with these bigger buildings, these new buildings, they're they're larger. Um, but all meals are included. There's lots included in a, in a in, um, laundry, you know, everything you're going to need for assisted living. And then you pay for care as you go. How do you pay for care with like that? Well, we'll talk about that later. But essentially, there's an assessment. And so you'll have an idea before you move in of what the care cost is going to look like. And then there's memory care. The difference between memory care and assisted living, number one, is the neighborhood is secure. So some folks have wandering or exit seeking behaviors, not everyone, or perhaps pacers. And so the area needs to be secure. So it's with a code um, that one goes in and out and the families of course have that code. And the other aspect to memory care is the ratio of caregiving to residents is higher because typically as the disease process advances, more care is needed, more hands-on care, everything from grooming to even perhaps feeding. So they have the ability to offer much higher care. Other than that, assisted living is a great option. Many people who live in assisted living have some type of cognitive impairment or brain change. So that does not make your loved one necessarily qualify for memory care. Okay, Debbie, next slide. Uh, go If you'll explain that, Melissa. Sure. So a continuing care retirement community, and they're referred to as CCRCs, are buildings that have all, you know, in all three levels we just talked about, independent living, assisted living, memory care on site. But the biggest difference is they also have skilled care, skilled nursing or nursing home. All those names are interchangeable. So that's in a private setting more than the traditional nursing home, which is going to be in more of an institutional setting but both of them still have doctors and nurses around 24 seven. We can talk about skilled nursing later and specifics about that, but some people that's important to, of course, we all know that skilled nursing is not, you should not assume that that is part of the progression because those are for medical needs. Um, the CCRCs require an entrance fee and they can range from $250,000 up to over a million dollars. They prov the reason they have an entrance fee is because they are typically nonprofit organizations. They invest that money because there is a guarantee for the residents. Once you move in, if you run out of money, you can stay. So people move into CCRCs generally as couples that are younger because they understand they're going to be able to stay. That's why there's the continuum of care, even if they run out of money and then you know, the large entrance fee you pay is returned back to the estate when you no longer live there anymore. Um, there are only nine in Atlanta, but, you know, they could be, they're a good choice for those that don't mind that, that expense and that are a bit younger. You do have to go into independent living first, though. You can't move directly into assisted living because those levels are you know, made for the residents that are members first. Now, more and more, we are seeing communities that are taking a step out of that and allowing some to move in assisted living. That's a new concept, so it just depends. Um, but then it may mean that you have two apartments. You still do have a monthly cost, even with the large entrance fee, just like you would at any community. But I just do want to make the distinction that there are a number of properties that are not CCRCs that do have all three living types on the campus. So independent, assisted, and memory care. There's the difference is skilled care. We can go to the next slide. So senior apartments, uh, we we don't work with senior apartments as often, but they, there are they're sprinkled throughout the city. Some of them are owned by the by the counties and uh, you can qualify, but they usually have a very long wait time. Those are, they have low income options in those. There are others being built uh, by private developers and um, they're 55 plus, you have your own apartment. It's not as um, organized. 
as in independent living, which we'll talk about next. Um, and it is, they usually don't have meals. They have some activities or not an activities director, but it might be resident driven. Um, some of them are very nice apartment buildings and they're in areas of town where uh, their children might be living. So they wanna live uh, away from them and with peers, but um, not, you know, but, but not in senior living. And besides the tall, the tall buildings that are built, like Jana was saying, um, by the by the state and offer low income housing, also senior apartments are like your general post apartments. They are literally an apartment complex um, that have an age minimum so that people are living amongst their peers. So it is definitely your own apartment, your own utilities, all of that's on your own. Okay, and Debbie. So independent living is a community. It's different than living independently in your own home because there is some, there are organized activity, organized meals, like Melissa said earlier, and some oversight. Some of these independent living communities have a button that you push every day that, that alerts the front desk that you're awake, you're in your apartment, you're having your coffee, but it does give peace of mind to, to grown children and to, uh, the community itself, They're, they often offer transportation, housekeeping, and certainly activities, um, movie theaters on site, things like that. So that there's a lot of gathering and a lot of independent living activities are resident driven. So it's depending on what you wanna see in the building. Right, and or groups you may wanna start. Communities love it when residents move in and maybe they're gardeners and wanna start a garden club or there's a men's group that want to get together and play poker every Tuesday night. So those are the kinds of activities that are driven by the residents. Um, also uh, significant about independent living is they will have a full kitchen and either washer and dryers in the unit or you know on the floor. So some of them have services you can pay for laundry, but that's the biggest difference in terms of the apartments that they are, they are full kitchens. So before we switch from independent living, I do want to reiterate what Melissa said earlier about shared care. So a lot of the independent living communities have a care company on site that are usually there during the day. If your loved one needs medication help or uh, just help overseeing the shower, but don't need help showering or uh, even just laundry, help with laundry, you can hire that shared care company for a very small increment of time. And that allows people to live an independent living longer. Uh, often the, the increment of time is as small as 15 minutes. And so you're not paying that four to six hour minimum of having them come into your home and take care of you. Uh, obviously assisted living is, is uh, what we primarily end up, it's a larger category. Um, so before we even get to talking about assisted living, I want to add that this transition from independent living to assisted living is often um, a, a slight, a gray area. And it's not up to us to decide who gets to be in assisted living or independent living. And it's not always up to you as a consumer, as the person moving in. Um, it is often up to the communities themselves. So they they will assess your loved one in assisted living to see where they fit in and how much care they need. And this assessment is a state regulation. So everybody will be assessed in assisted living. Um, the, the assessment will tell, tell the communities a little bit about what someone what kind of care someone might need and i want to i want to um define the first term on here which is the activities of daily living activities of daily living amongst those activities can we count showering dressing toileting uh shaving obviously grooming of all kinds feeding eating um am i missing any melissa mobility just the five Mm -hmm. and mobility. Um, so those are very important uh, to the community because it tells them how much time somebody will have to spend with your loved one. 
and helping them so that they understand how much staff to have, what kind of staffing they need, and 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 what you personally might need. I know you want to add something, Melissa. <laughs> well, I was just going to talk about assisted living has state requirements. As I mentioned earlier, this is where the regulations come in from the state. And this is also where you want to, we want to encourage you to not wait too long. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So the main two from the state are you need to be able to bear your own weight, which means that someone can't be bed bound and which means that their knees can't buckle. It absolutely does mean though that they can have assistance. They can have assistance standing up and they can have assistance while standing, one person or two person, but you just can't have knees buckling. The second one is pivoting. So this is uh, this is more of a gray area, it just means that if you're transitioning from a bed to a chair, vice versa, that you can somewhat assist in the pivot process. But like I said, that's kind of a gray area. And then of course it's up to the nurse, they have the final say whether or not they can take care of a resident. It's not necessarily always because the care needs are high, but they also have to base that decision on staffing. If they already have five very high level of care residents and their staffing ratios are staying within the requirements, hopefully less more than the requirements, then they may not be able to accept your loved one, even though they're totally appropriate for assisted living. And so when we get to skilled care and talking about medical care versus care and even in a decline, um, you can age in place in assisted living. It doesn't mean that you have to move the, if you become bed bound or if you don't meet those state requirements anymore. Once you're there, once you move in, that's your home. That is where you live and you're able to stay there uh, unless there's a reason that the community can't take care of your loved one or if medical um, care is needed. It is really important for you to know that this is your home, um, that this is your loved one's home, because we feel very strongly uh, that people feel comfortable, meaning if there are, if you walk into a community and they say you can't have a pet and your loved one loves the cat so much that it brings them that kind of joy, then that community is not a good community fit for you. And it would not be something that we would recommend. The same would go for a visiting hours. Um, if they tell you, yes, you can't come after seven because the doors are shut. That's not a good answer to us because this is your home and you should be able to visit your loved one anytime you want to. Um, we feel pretty strongly about that. I wanted to add something that uh, we felt very strongly about in this, in this presentation that we have pictures of our, we did not use stock photos. There are lots of stock photos out there we chose to ask our, our, our clients who we've worked with, people who we consider our friends and, and even family, that we wanted to use photos of people we, we've helped. And so all the photos you see today are people we've actually placed in senior living and helped and maintained a relationship with. Next slide, Debbie, I think. Yep. So memory care, we've talked a lot about leadership Memory care all, always has a separate director. And it's very important to us that a memory care neighborhood have its own philosophy, that they have to they have to not just be housing somebody and feeding them. We believe in specialized and tailored programming for people. We believe in a philosophy that people use to both take care of that their needs and also to entertain and engage them in a meaningful way. Uh, we've said at the bottom, the right facility with the right approach is crucial. And we feel very strongly about that. And what Jana, you know, what we're referring to, when we talk about programming is you, it's a day program, right? There are activities throughout the day to keep them engaged. As we know, those neurons need to be continuing to fire. So it's not that they're in their room. And I, I just wanna say that in memory care and, and a good memory care, you don't wanna just see residents sitting in front of the TV. 
you know, um, it should be meaningful engagement, um, music, word games, even balloon volleyball, things that are um, helping them with even chair exercises or getting out into the courtyard. Um, memory care residents, it doesn't mean that they're in the neighborhood all the time. A, neighbor, a community needs to take them out. You know, they'll go on a single uh, or a little scenic drive in the community bus and sometimes go for ice cream. I mean, they should be able to leave too. Um, and they have, you know, wheelchair, of course, accessible transportation, but programming, and that goes along with the philosophy too. What are they following? You may have, many of you may know Tifa Snow and some others that have written specific programs based on philosophies um, that are important. So when we say, what, you know, what are you going by? What's your programming like? And it's like, well, we just do whatever. We have just an activities calendar. That's something to evaluate. And in memory care, it's important that the, the schedule for each resident is in the morning, they bring everyone out into the main common area. They, the goal is to not have anyone in their apartment. Um, just there's a smaller number, usually between 19 and 26 residents in memory care. And the staff to care uh, resident ratio, the state requirement is six re one caregiver to every six residents. Of course, we always like to see more <laughs> than that, but that's at least the minimum um, during the day. Whereas in assisted living, it's one caregiver to 15 residents, which again, we'd like to see one caregiver more to every 12 or 11 residents. Um, we understand that you all might be more interested in hearing about memory care, and we're happy to talk about it as long as you want. If you have certain questions, we would love to hear those. Uh, and we'll be happy to answer as, man as many as we can. Um, Debbie? A personal care home is, first of all, there are hundreds of personal care homes in the city of Atlanta. Um, and we're based in Atlanta, so we know this area best. Uh, personal care homes, um, it, it, it's easy to find one. It's hard to find a good one. We believe that we know which ones, we, we visited most of these homes and feel very good about the ones we recommend. They are often actual houses. They're in neighborhoods and they house three to eight or so people. Uh, and it's a very small ratio. It's a good level of care. A lot of times it's for people who need a very high level of care. They don't do a ton of activities because people don't seem to need the kind of stimulation that those activities bring, but the care becomes an activity. They might gather together at the kitchen table and do something. They certainly gather for family style meals. All of those can be tailored to whatever diet your loved one is on. There's a lot of personal attention. Most of the time, they are higher levels of care and more end of life kinds of people. I do wish there were personal care homes for all different levels of, of care because I think some people need that quiet, loving care and attention. But this is what we have found and um, we feel it is a lovely, lovely model of senior living uh, for the right people and, and with the right caregivers. So personal care homes is the type of senior living option that we do the most explaining. If someone is familiar with a personal care home, it's usually from the news and it's usually not good. Um, people have escaped or mistreatment. So I just want to say that there are a few bad apples that really give the whole concept a bad name. Um, to that end, Personal care homes have the same license from the state that the big buildings do. So same inspections, same fire safety requirements, same requirements for training and medication management. So just because you're in a home doesn't mean that there's no oversight because there absolutely is the same. And as Jana mentioned about activities that really aren't the focus of a personal care home, the other thing you have to consider is transportation. So if you need help, um, getting your loved one to a doctor appointment or taking them for, you know, picking up prescriptions or whatever it is, 
it's not going to be offered because an owner is typically one of the main caregivers. And then of course they have, they hire other caregivers. Yes. There are people there overnight. Um, yes. People, there are different ones on the weekends. It's not, you know, Monday to Sunday, the same caregiver. That's actually one of the criteria that we look at when evaluating personal care homes. Everybody needs a break. It's just not reasonable for someone to work seven days a week. Um, the other thing is mobility. Even if you're not high care with a uh, hands-on needs, someone really, so if you have things like MS, um, you have very high mobility challenges, you're in a smaller environment in a home. So of course we all know you can have a fall anywhere, but falls can be minimized in a lot of different ways. And so being in a home environment is a good thing to consider if mobility is a huge issue. Uh, the other thing is an assisted living and a larger building, they're on a schedule, you know, so the caregivers have a rotation, you know, they, they get residents up usually early in the morning to get dressed for the day to be for breakfast. Well, in a personal care home, you can be in your robe all day if you want. You can sleep in till 10 a.m. if you want. So that's just the scheduling is different. So if you have someone who just wants a more laid back, relaxed environment, then personal care home would be something you may want to consider. And I'll say this too about Jana's point about they are residential homes, like in a neighborhood, great personal care homes don't really look amazing from the outside. <laughs> so don't be fooled. Uh, the inside is clean. The care is amazing. Many are run by nurses, former nurses, former um, healthcare professionals, and their priority is definitely not the yard. <laughs> it's definitely not in great upkeep sometimes. So the first impression on personal care homes can vary, but I assure you when you walk in, you'll find a loving environment. Okay, Debbie. So skilled nursing is what you mostly probably know of as a nursing home. Uh, although we do hear many people refer to all senior living as a nursing home. Uh, we are very clear that obviously those are not, that's not the case. Skilled nursing facilities, offer a very high level of care and it is 24 seven and it can be medical. Uh, we, we know that assisted living cannot handle certain medical needs. Uh, that being said, when someone gets to a certain age or a certain level of their memory loss, we often find people don't seek out some of those medical needs anyway. So we don't do placement in skilled nursing because it's a state uh, run system, but we have certainly had experience with people going into skilled nursing homes and also coming out of them. Um, they have very limited social engagement because care is the primary uh, activity of the day and um, what they do well. Um, they're very, they're more hospital-like settings, a little more institutional. And, uh, but there are certain times when it is the the only way for someone to live uh, outside of the home. And it is an important place. The, these are important places. Very often rehab is housed in these skilled nursing homes. So a lot of our clients are coming out of rehab straight into assisted living. So we do hear more and more about them. Okay, so one of the biggest things to think about between assisted living and skilled nursing facilities in terms of care is the medical aspect. So if you need a ventilator or if you need continuous IV medication administration, uh, multiple types of feeding tubes, those are anything protruding the body like that is medical. So that can't be handled by assisted living. So it's not necessarily that your loved one has declined or they're bed bound. That's not necessarily the case. If they need to be surrounded by doctors and nurses 24 seven, that is the facility that provides that. Um, also, if you're needing Medicaid assistance, then skilled nursing is the place that Medicaid will pay for um, one stay long-term. If it's not a Medicaid situation, then skilled nursing is still private pay. And you're gonna start at about $11,000 a month minimum um, for private pay and skilled nursing. 
So a lot of people ask, well, how long can I stay in assisted living? Am I going to have to move? Well, like Jana was saying, it's possible you could if you need that medical attention or if it's extremely high care. But other than that, you can age in place in assisted living, especially with the help of hospice and other services that can be brought in. Um, and it's, you know, so I just don't want it to be that everyone, the progression is all the way, you know, always to skilled care. Like I talked about earlier in a CCRC, that does not mean that your loved one will be there. Uh, just so you know, also, it's a very good question to ask when visiting a community. Uh, can my loved one stay here till end of life? And what would what would make my loved one not be able to stay until end of life? So those are very good questions to ask. Um, Debbie, we want to give y'all plenty of time to ask questions. So let's finish up this quickly. Respite care is the same as assisted living, but it is for a short term, usually 14 to 30 days. And it is, you would be treated as if you were assisted living. We don't also do a lot of respite care because most of the time when someone asks for respite care, they really need to be in assisted living and end up moving in. Uh, it is a good way for someone who needs to go away for that 14 to 30 days. Uh, but it is a lot of, also a lot of, it's the same amount of work to get someone placed in respite care as it is in assisted living. But um, many communities do it pr primarily when they have availability in their building. Okay. Yeah, and I'll just add to that real quick that respite in terms of cost. Respite care usually starts around 150 a day, can go up to three, three hundred and fifty dollars a day. So this is just an overview of what you get when you have uh the checks or what you can get in the different kinds of living. And um hopefully we've covered this pretty well. Mm -hmm. All right, Debbie. Pricing is a little bit hard to talk about. It ranges, as you can see in our diagram, it ranges quite, uh, it is a varied situation. It is not only uh, varied by how a community looks, it, 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 it is literally um, where they are, how they look, how many staff they have. It's, it's, it's just, there's so many variables. Um, and, uh, and costs are so high, obviously in senior living, but I would say that the, the costs, so you can be in an assisted living at $4,000 or all the way up to 10, but I wouldn't say that you get better, necessarily better assisted living at 10,000, but it might feel more comfortable and it might be more, uh, palatable. So we try and talk to people about real estate and about what things look like and versus what care and engagement looks like. So hopefully that's something we help to guide people with. So we'll just real quick back to pricing. This is where things get very creative and kind of the marketing and sales kind of way. You know, we act as a buffer. We're on the family side. So it's to help that marketing sales aspect be just taken out of the equation. So you don't have pressure to sign a thing to the month or an apartment today is this price and next month is going to be on sale. Um, but they all have very different pricing structures. So one may have level of care, one may have points, one may be all inclusive. It's hard to just to compare apples to apples. So that's another reason that it's not just going to be one price at, you know, the apartment rate is usually one rate. A care rate isn't usually another rate to add up to your total. If there are two people, there's a second person rate. So it's not right off the bat. If you see on the internet or a brochure, it's a starting price for an apartment. It does not include any other kind of care in assisted living, memory care, or personal care home. And you also need to take in consideration for a budget, there will be annual increases. Usually from four to eight percent is what we're seeing, a huge increase after COVID, but they're coming down now to about four and eight percent um, annually. All right, next page, but we're gonna skip over this and answer. I see there's a lot of questions, so I wanna be able to answer this. We hope that you'll reach out to us. If you need any help at all, please reach out to us with questions. We take our work very seriously and placement becomes important to us um, in working very individually with each one of you. So that is not something we take lightly at all. 
So I saw that there were a bunch of questions in the Q&A. Yes, uh, Janet and Melissa, thank you for such an informative and excellent presentation. Um, I really appreciate the work that you all do and have have great respect for both of you and have had wonderful experiences with you and your great organization. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go ahead and launch into questions because I know our time is limited. Uh, the first question I see is, is there any ranking or scoring of independent living, assisted living and temporary care facilities in Metro Atlanta? Melissa, you want to take that? Was it, I'm sorry, was it scoring? Was that the question? Yeah, they're ranking, ranking or scoring. scoring. Okay. So there's not necessarily a ranking in terms of scoring. So it's very, everything is public. When I talked earlier about inspections and regulations um, annually, or if there's a problem called in and someone needs to come out, all of those reports are public information and they're found on the Department of Community Health website into the personal care section and you can look up a community name or a personal care home name and you can see information like the ownership and all the inspection reports if they're incident reports. So there are things that you can view by that. I would be leery per se of the Google reviews. Sometimes they're um, reasonable, sometimes not reasonable. I mean, today's world, if you're unhappy with something, that's kind of the only way we have to vent sometimes. So there's context of situations, but you know, you can read through those and talk through your advisor about what do you consider is, you know, important in some of these reviews, but there's not necessarily a ranking. For skilled care, there is, it's through Medicare, and they absolutely have a ranking and they have the reports and they give them a grade, so. Thank you so much, Melissa, that was a great answer. Um, and working with a placement specialist allows you to kind of get the insider scoop on those rankings. Um, or just the status of different communities that would be really helpful. Um, what is the cost comparison in a personal care home? I think you guys did a good job of sharing that in your slide. Um, do you want to say anything else to that? I think that slide that you shared was, was extremely helpful with the price ranges. The only thing I'd add is that many times I get the question, well, if we go a little further out of Metro Atlanta, is it going to be less expensive? And the answer is no, because typically, as you get further north or further, further you know, northeast, they only have fewer options. So they stay full and they don't have to discount prices. So it's not necessarily the case that in a different location, it's going to be less expensive. That's a great point, thank you. Um, Over-the-counter medication and assisted living, is the decision regarding having over-the-counter medications in the apartment determined by the community or state regulation? It's determined by state regulations. So any kind of even vitamins or things that are administered PRN, like you know Advil or something, or any other PRN medication, a doctor has to write an order for it. And it's packaged in um, the bubble packs, like a, car, a punch card that where medications are distributed. You know, assisted living is a community and they're all friends and people like to share. <laughs> so um with each other so you can't have those things in the apartment but you absolutely can have them for your loved one it just needs to be an official order right and that includes like topical medications as well mm -hmm. eye drops anything yeah yep, yep. cough drops sometimes um, i imagine many facilities offer various levels of care would they call services the same thing as you made them here that is, how can I ensure a place I consider that has the various levels that I seek? I'm not sure I understand this question. I, don't I think that it's it's asking for the the various services that people. So thinking about the terminology of independent living, assisted living, memory care, um, those are the terms that you will see in this industry and across kind of the board. I think the lingo and language that you guys shared is pretty consistent with anything I've ever seen in the market. Although I will say that um, people try and stay away from these words because they are institutional words, really. Um, so they might call their assisted living enhanced living, and they might call their memory care uh, the neighborhood. And so you might find different terms, but you can usually get a marketer to talk about it in the terms you are familiar with. 
Great answer, Jan. How can I tell my parents' insurance coverage what may or may not be covered, even partially? Okay, so all senior living is private pay. So independent living, assisted living, memory care, and as I already mentioned about skilled nursing, how that ends up being private pay. So no insurance. Um, the only benefit that is available is to a veteran for assistance. And that is, of course, distributed through the Veterans Administration. There are services that can help you with that application. We can direct you to. But other than the Veterans Administration, there isn't any other financial assistance. Um, on a federal level, a county, counties, state, there are other services for housing, as we mentioned about senior apartments. But everything's private pay. There's no insurance. Um, and sometimes that's a little bit confusing. I'll also say for a lot of our patients, um, they have long-term care insurance. I just, about, I just realized after I said that, yes, long-term care insurance, of course, if you have that. And it depends on your policy, but there will be an elimination period that you have to wait 30 or 60 days typically uh, in order to start it. You need to be paying for care first for that long. And then it's not going to cover independent living. You have to have either two ADLs or three ADLs you need assistance with. Your individual policy will dictate that. But that can be worked out with the community so the insurance company can pay them directly. Great. Thank you. How does long-term care insurance enter into the financial equation? I feel like we just answered that question. Um, these prices reflected on the slide are per month, correct? Correct. Correct. What did you say the annual increase was in the market for senior living? It's generally four to 8%. Uh, and we had a- okay. mm -hmm. Annually, right? That's right. It's not a given, but generally speaking, it's annually. And I'll just make this extra comment. It's important to ask when the increase takes place. So some communities will have it on your anniversary month. If you move in in November and you move into a community that does it on a calendar basis, that means in January you will get an increase. So it does matter the time of year that an increase can go into effect. When should we investigate future senior living options if not needed in the near term future, but could be at some point? So I'm going to say this. We get calls from a variety of different kinds of people. We get calls for people who are looking four years away, five years away. I'm just looking for my future, which is great. We love that. We get calls from somebody who's being released from the rehab tomorrow and they need to move into senior living tomorrow. Uh, obviously that's not ideal and we can help when we can, but we would love for people not to call us in a crisis. Mm -hmm. Obviously we can help, we are happy to help and we will help anybody at any time. But if you wait until someone is in a crisis, then you are stuck with whatever availability is out there in the world, uh, whether it's close to your home or in your budget or anything, uh, you are you are stuck. You will not get the place necessarily you want to get for your loved one because you're calling when the shoe dropped. And, and that's, uh, we would prefer someone do that er as early as possible. Right, so I just want to add to that, just the early, the earlier the better, Shannon is saying, the earlier the better. However, when it comes to that point, it's always good to have a plan B or a plan C. It's always good. So it's always good to have this narrowed down to communities that could be a consideration. And I just want to say could be a consideration because if you visit a community today, eight months down the road, we could have a huge turnover in staff or leadership, or the community has been bought by a new corporation and things have changed. So it's good to have options, but it doesn't mean that you're just automatically going to go. We'll have to help you decide if that's still the best place because things change. And that being said, Jenny, we are happy to help you when you're called the day before your loved one's being released and help in any way possible. We certainly are apprised of what's out there at that moment and what's available. So it would be hard to find that on your own that late a date extremely helpful. Y'all have done it many times. Um, and then last question is, how do they get paid, client or facility? I'm assuming this question means, how are you all compensated? 
we are paid by the community. We are a free service to families. We worked with families for four and five years and we don't get paid until someone moves in. And oftentimes people don't move in for whatever reason. We are happy to work with any family at any time. And because we work with every community in town, we don't have to, we don't have to favor one over another at any time. So we want to find the best fit for your family, not for us and not for the communities. And we don't have to do that. We are very free to, to work with everybody and to, uh, to recommend the best, the best fit. And so I just want to add to that, the way which we're compensated by communities is the same. We're given a percentage. And so it doesn't matter to us which community you choose. It's the family's choice. It doesn't matter to us on a financial basis. Um, and as Jana said, we work with everyone in town. It does not mean that we recommend everyone by any means. Um, and we certainly don't have a way to steer people to certain communities. Our company works everywhere in Metro Atlanta. Some companies work only in certain zip codes, only in certain territories. That's something you definitely want to evaluate when you're looking at a company to work with because you want, you have to pivot. There are times when you have to pivot. Your sister in Texas may be flying in and decide to take over. You know, you, you just things yeah. change. So you need to have someone who's covering all of Metro Atlanta. Thank you. So um, I, I, I think also that the, the communities are willing to uh, pay placement folks because they really do want residents who are going to thrive there. They want a good match. Um, so, I, And I want to thank everybody. We are out of time. And so please, please reach out to um, Jana and Melissa. If you have more questions for them, please reach out to Debbie or Jenny or myself or Ashley Barner, uh, if you have any questions for us. Thank you so much, Jana and Melissa, for your time today. We Thank appreciate you for all having the information us. you Thank shared. You so much. Thank all right, you. join us next month, everyone.